Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of uh, Songwriting Simplify with me, Johnny Lipsham, here at johnnylipshamstudios.co.uk here in Scotland, which, of course, is the centre of everything, especially when there's an eclipse. You know it's Scotland when there's an eclipse. I had to get an eclipse kind of joke in there. Anyway, uh, I hope everybody is doing well. Apologies for the slightly lower pitched voice than normal, and it does sound a wee bit huskier, and it does sound a wee bit quieter as well. Yes, uh, I have been really quite unpleasantly unwell with a viral infection. It's not been particularly entertaining. Uh, Brett says, glad you're feeling better. I'm not really feeling better. I just, you know, didn't do a show on Sunday and felt bad about not doing a show. So I'm here. Uh, and uh, I, I was in work today as well because work needs done. So, <laughs> so yeah, so I... I dragged my wee scrawny Scottish butt out of bed this morning and I did a full day of work and uh, then uh, I got myself sorted out for doing the show this evening. I have no idea what what we're going to do or what we're going to talk about. I just felt that I should do a songwriting simplified show. So you guys are going to have to help me out here a wee bit with some suggestions, some things to talk about, some questions, that kind of stuff because uh, otherwise this is going to be quite hard. But I don't mind difficult. I don't mind hard. I don't mind complicated. It's fine. Uh, you know, uh, I I work best when I'm under pressure, I think. I think. Maybe I do. Yeah, I think I'll probably do work best when I'm under pressure. So uh, I have the volume cranked on this microphone because believe it or not, it won't come across on YouTube, but my voice today is very, very quiet because I just don't have a lot of power at the moment. I'm all congested from about here to about here. It's not much fun. Uh, it's not flu. It's not COVID. I've been tested for all of those, and it's not whooping cough. been tested for that as well. Everything's fine, uh, even though I think, my, I think I might have broken my personal record for a number of sneezes in a row which previously had stood at 77, I got to 82 before finally nosebleed. <laughs> Normally the nosebleed comes much, much sooner, but this time it was like 82 in a row, uh, which of course has got to be good for the old diaphragm muscles. So maybe some of this flab that's here will go away from all of that sneezing. So maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> maybe sneezing is a good thing for exercising one's diaphragm muscles and, and you know, getting all of that belly fat away. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, let's go see who is here first. And it was Kyle who was here. Well done. He says, I win. Yes, I do permit you. I do permit you, Kyle, to do a lap of your studio and uh, pat yourself on the back at the same time whilst you're doing that. Um, just make sure to send me video evidence of this. That'd be cool. Uh, <laughs> Sean Harron is here. John Hawk is here. Just Bob is here. He says, I'm going to miss the show uh, on his way to Queen's Reich and Armored Saint. I have no idea who they are, but that's where you, that's who you're going to see. Cool. Uh, and he says he'll watch the replay. Uh, please do uh, tell me how it goes, what kind of show it was. Uh, and he's, he says, hit the like button. Yes, there are 15 people watching just the now. And only seven likes. So if you like what I'm doing, even if I'm sick, then please hit that like button. It helps me, it helps my channel, and it helps you because helping me and helping my channel helps you because it keeps me going. It keeps me making content. It keeps me doing this show um, at midnight. Uh, so there, there's plenty of reasons there for you to hit the like button. Uh, let's see who else is here. Chris Rackner's here. He says, maybe you need an assistant. Yeah, please no, Chris, I did say bear with me. So yes, there is a bear with me. He's around here somewhere. Uh, he's, uh, he also says awesome chicken and noodle soup. Well, actually I had chicken soup for my lunch today uh, and I had lots of chicken soup yesterday. Um, uh, fortunately for me, I have my, my mother is Jewish. So, um, uh, and so she has a fantastic chicken soup recipe made from chicken stock. So I put that to good use. 
And yes, it was awesome. And kind of does actually work, surprisingly. Uh, Boris is here. Boris Dancy says, Since you're sick, let's explore something fun. Modes against key signatures in pop slash current music as it relates to melodies and counter melodies. That's something we could definitely explore to some extent. Uh, Donovan says, sorry to hear you're sick. Thank you very much, Don. I appreciate that. Danny Taylor is here as well. And Brett Marley says, glad to see you feeling better. Like I said, I'm kind of not really, but I'm here. That's the important thing. So I apologize for all the sniffles and, and snorts and all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's not going to be very nice. Um, <clears throat> and coughing and all of that kind of stuff. I apologize for all of that. You're going to have to put up with all of those, all of those kind of sounds. Uh, let's see. And we've gone from 17 down to 13. So meh, there's a few people that don't like the, the sound of a sick person. Uh, Paul Morgan is here and Bobby Booth is here as well. And Kyle says, and away we go. And Chris says, when writing new material, do you start with the verse, bridge or chorus? That is a great question. That is a really good question. We will answer that one as well. John Hawk says, good to have you, Johnny. Wish you much better. Thank you very much. Brett says, my record is five continuous minutes. Um, wow. Yeah. About two to four hundred woofy nasally. Yes, that's kind of yeah, if if you've got good EQ on your on your uh YouTube or your TV or whatever you're watching the show on, a nice little bell curve dip out ran between two hundred to four hundred would be a good idea for my speaking voice. Uh Danny says Campbell's makes a ghost pepper chicken soup that'll cure anything or kill you. <laughs> you get a fifty fifty shot. Well, that's good to know. I mean, you know, that kind of life is like that anyway. And he's just gone and retracted that. So <laughs> I don't know why you retracted that, Danny. That was good. That was funny. Yeah, please type that out again. Put that back. It was funny. I like that. Thank you. All right. So uh, we will deal with Chris's question first. Then we'll get on to Boris's because Boris is a bit broader and a bit trickier to unpack. So answering Chris's question first is going to buy me some thinking time. <laughs> and in the meantime, if anyone else has any other questions, please do put them in the chat as well. And if you're watching for the very first time and you've just come across this channel and uh, you're not subscribed, you're not going to be able to ask me a question until you subscribe, mate. So please do. And when you do, you just have to wait two little minutes and then the chat will miraculously open up for you. There won't be like, showers and a chorus of angels singing unfortunately that's very expensive um but um yes the chat will be opened up to you and you can ask your question and uh you can tell me where you're from as well if you're brand new uh i would appreciate that all right so let's get to chris's question when writing new material do you start with the verse the bridge or chorus that is a great question um see the way i tend to write is because my songs tend to be narratives, so they're stories, basically. I have characters, and I populate my songs with these weird people, and I put them in uh, scenarios where they should or should not get along, and I basically see what happens with them and let the song write itself that way. So I tend to start with the punchline first. And this is the way I teach songwriting, actually. When I've taught this, uh, when I've taught this at high school, or even at undergraduate level, um, or even, you know, kind of adult evening classes as well. I've taught songwriting. Um, so I tend to say, start with the punchline first. You know, every song, even if it's not comedy, it should have a punchline. It should have the most important part of the song, which is in your chorus. It's the hook line of your chorus. The thing that is the central part of the message of your song that you want to get across whether it's funny, whether it's serious, whatever it is, that is the center point of your song. And everything else in your song revolves around that line, whatever that is. And most common place to put that is in the chorus, because the chorus is the bit that everybody is going to want to, you know, sing, right? So um, I always suggest start with the chorus. 
um, and hone that corner. Spend some time shaping it, distilling it down. Start with something that's maybe a wee bit bigger and then distill it down to its bare bones basic elements um, in terms of its lyrical con com uh, content. There we go, that's the word I was trying to say. So it might be that you start with four or five lines. Great, that's fine. You can have a chorus that's four or five lines. But because you want the listener to grab this very, very quickly, um, pretty much instantly on the first listen, you want them to have that in their ear, in their mind, and beginning to make that journey downwards towards here, towards their heart, so that it actually completely encapsulates that person's imagination. They get caught up in the song. So take those five lines, distill them down to the bare bones basics. Strip away extraneous words like the and a ah and, you know, words like that. Once you've taken away those words, then see what you've got left. And if you've got like two lines, go, OK, I have two lines. What other words can I take away without taking away from the meaning of this and with, without taking away the power and the punch of this line or of these two lines and if you get it down to one line great this is something that you can repeat so you can nail this line like you know a nail in the wall or a nail between the forehead between the eyes in the forehead of your listener three or four times and there you go you've got your hook line and by the time they've heard this line a couple of times in your in your first chorus they're kind of getting it they're kind of yeah, yeah, I, I, I can sing this now. I feel confident enough to sing along with this. By the time you get to the second chorus, you should have them totally singing that chorus and totally getting it and totally digging it. And they're listening, therefore, to the rest of the song to get the context of what the chorus is about. So I always recommend start with the chorus and once you've got the chorus, then you can start with your story, work your story backwards from there. So how did we get to this point? How do we get to this line? How did we get here? What's the story that, that this arrives at? And then, it, and then work it backwards. So it might be the story is he dies or she dies or... Um, he breaks her heart, and that's kind of your punchline of your song. If it's one of those, you know, ballads that's kind of a love song, but it's also a um, the, a relationship's gone bad kind of song that that you know everybody that's been through a breakup. That's a classic breakup song. You start, you know, your chorus centers around the breakup, and then you work backwards through the narrative. Right? Okay, so we got to a breakup. So what happened before the breakup? What happened to start? The, the chain of reaction of events or words that were spoken or things that were done that led to that, uh, to start in that chain reaction that leads to the breakup. Okay, what is the chain reaction? What are the events that, that lead to the breakup? Those chain reaction events that lead to the breakup. What started that chain reaction? And then you work back from there. Who are these two people? How did they get together? How did they meet? How do they know each other? How long have they known each other? What drew them together? What was it about her that got him interested in her? What was it about him that got her interested? And that's kind of where you start. So, you know, so you, you start with the, with the kind of like writing a novel. You start with what's the conclusion of my novel? What's the conclusion of my story? they die <laughs> if you're right if you're into like writing really dark stories they die everybody dies in the end okay great we've got a whole bunch of characters that die in the end what are the chain reaction events that lead up to this cataclysmic event that leads to all of their deaths and how are they going to die are they going to die in really quite plain mundane ordinary ways where they just you know i don't know fall asleep with a cigarette in their hand in their armchair and they set fire to the armchair, kaboom, they go up. Or are they going to die in some in some way that's far more creative and imaginative? They happen to be waiting to cross the road adjacent to a construction site. There is um, a heavy roller that's like maybe 10, 15, 20 yards away 
and this construction site is on a wee bit of a hill. The guy is like standing there waiting to cross the road. The spring for the brake gives way on the, on the heavy roller. Heavy roller starts moving very, very slowly, yet imperceptibly towards this person that is waiting to cross the road. And that's an imaginative way to die. So you, that could be your punchline. This, this crazy way that this person dies. Uh, and then you want to tell the, the backstory of who this person is and how they get there. Uh, and then you can summarize that kind of event of death in some macabre, humoristic kind of way. Whatever your style is, start with that and then work backwards, is what I've always taught. Uh, but like I said, there's no rules. You could start the other way. You could basically start with start writing verses and start fleshing out the story first and then go, OK, now how do I encapsulate? How do I summarize this story? And that's your chorus. So there's different ways to uh, to develop a really good song, uh, even if you're not a storyteller, even if that even if the narrative style is not you, it's not your thing. Narrative style is definitely me. I love inventing characters and doing weird things with those characters, putting them in strange scenarios and see kind of what happens to them. Um, I do that all the time with my songs. Um, I've written songs about bizarre ways to die. In fact. The one that I just told you about, the the uh, the heavy roller that squashed the guy to death, that's actually a true story. Um, and it was in one of the papers here in Scotland. Guy waiting to waiting to uh, cross the road. He should have crossed at the, the crossing point much further down the road, but it was a lazy git. He didn't want to do that. And so he crossed right next to this construction site. And the brakes did go on this heavy roller and he did not notice and he got run over very slowly by the heavy roller. And so, you know, certainly his trousers may have been creased earlier that morning. They're not creased anymore. And so, so that actually made it into one of my songs about death. Um, <laughs> you know, I have written a few songs about death just because sometimes I, th sometimes I think, you know what? We take we we are too scared of death and we take death too seriously and maybe sometimes we should poke a little bit of fun at it. So uh, yeah, I always, by and large, tend to start with the chorus and work my way backwards. But there are many different ways to do it. Okay, do we have any more questions? I'm not seeing anything more. Uh, so this could be very short. <laughs> uh, in actual fact. Uh, Johnny has a dark side. Yes, I'm a jazz musician with a dark, slightly macabre sense of humor. Uh, <laughs> just, just because, you know, I like to juxtapose. So, you know, so in the case of my, my, this particular song about death that I'm talking about is on an album that that's out of print, unfortunately, uh, you, you probably won't find it anymore. But anyway, um, the, that particular song, each verse was a different story about death, um, a, a different true story of somebody's actual death uh, that I found in three different newspaper articles that just struck me as being a wee bit weird. And so I thought, how can I juxtify, ju uh, uh, juxtapose death, which, you know, there's, there's a sad ending, especially for those that, uh, you know, for the, for the victim themselves, but also for those that knew the victim. And that's sad. And that's, you know, it's profoundly sad and upsetting and everything else. I'm not going to disagree with that. And I'm not going to say that that's, you know, not a thing because it is. But the, the, the manner of these deaths, I thought was funny. And so I had to write a song about that. Um, and so uh, I decided to, to do like a little four to the floor shuffle, Chicago kind of shuffle blues about it. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, so yes, I do have a slightly dark side. Um, and that song certainly did because it featured three completely weird and obscure ways of dying. Um, <clears throat> so yes, I do have a slightly dark side. Uh, 
Uh, Brett says, I would figure that Depeche Mode's blasphemous rumors was written in your style with the chorus first. I, you know what? I'm not familiar with that record. I am familiar with Depeche Mode, and uh, they are definitely not really my cup of tea, but I will say I do like their lyrics. Um, there's definitely a lot of wit in their, in their lyrics, for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm... They're, they're not really my style at all, <laughs> particularly. Um, but, I, yeah, I would suggest that maybe that is how most of their songs get written, that they start with a chorus and they work backwards. Um, for sure. All right, let's let's scroll up a wee bit and we'll, we'll talk about um, Boris's question here because it's a bit broader, it's a bit bigger, and I'm not sure I can really cover this in one video. Um, so he's talking about modes against key signatures in pop and current music as it relates to melodies and counter melodies. Okay, so you know what? There's a lot of songs, a lot of pop songs that are around at the moment that feature modes. Um, mostly because there is this trend at the moment uh, for a lot of songs to be more groove orientated they're much more about the beat and they're much more about the groove and so they are vamp orientated so it might be that the music doesn't move much from one particular chord and so when you have that happening in a pop song where there's a you know a decent four to the floor kind of uh action going on with the drums and maybe there's um you know, a nice little, you know, nice little funky bass line to go with that. Um, but the music is, is itself quite static. Um, then what are you going to do to kind of give this thing some life? And this is where a lot of pop songwriters, they know their stuff. They know their music theory. And a lot of them will just go, they will go with a mode. So um, uh, I'm trying to think who the artist is recently uh, who uh, was, was in the top five, I think. And it's not Alicia Keys. It's another black female artist. I'm trying to remember her name. And I, I remember listening to this song and her name will come to me eventually. Um, and she's kind of like, she's got an R&B style about her. But this particular song had definitely kind of a, a groove orientated vibe about it. There was a good drum groove, good four to the floor action on the kick drum, good backbeat on the snare drum. And then you had this nice little funky bass line, nice little uh, funky rhythm guitar part. Um, but the thing was really static harmonically. It wasn't really going anywhere. And that got me thinking, they've got to have something to hang their hat on. Otherwise, this is going to get a little bit boring. Now, granted, there's an awful lot of pop songs where they actually try to do this. They try to go for this groove, vamp oriented style. And the problem is the melodies just don't go anywhere. The melodies just revolve around, you know... You know, just around those, those kind of first four notes of, you know, the, the, you know, the, I mean, that's kind of like uh, a C minor pentatonic scale, really. You know, it's a C minor pentatonic scale. So, so, you know, a lot of that is being, you know... It's fine, it's okay, uh, but it's kind of a little bit limited. But there's a lot of melodies that are written that way in a lot of today's popular music. So what can we do with this? Uh, you know, especially if it is just... Which is just a C minor chord. So what can we do with this? And this is where you hear some really interesting things, especially in like a pre-chorus. So let's say we've got this little. 
you know, this kind of little bluesy kind of uh, uh, minor pentatonic scale thing happening. Well, this is one of the things that I heard that really stru stuck out to me because I was like, oh, here we go again. It's another one of these little, you know, minor things that gets really annoying because every song is the same. Well, this is what the melody did, and it caught me by surprise in the, the lead up to the chorus. It did this. Well, what mode is this? It's the C Dorian scale. <laughs> That's what that is. And I was just like, oh, we got this natural six in here. It's, it's the C Dorian mode. Yay. But it was just like, it hadn't been used up until this pre-chorus moment. It was, it was one of these songs where the verse was probably overly long with just this repeated motif that goes over and over again and you know they're kind of a little bit insufferably boring but it really stuck really stuck out at me when they went to this a natural the cool thing about it was that they went with that harmonically in the chord changes they moved from playing in the keyboard part they moved to doing this Now I know that's really subtle and it's like an F triad going back to this E flat triad. But it went with that. I was just like, that's so cool and so clearly Dorian mode. So I thought, ah, see, they do know their stuff. Um, but then when it got to the chorus, it was a different mode again, which was brilliant because they had this kind of dark, kind of minor kind of thing going on, you know, the, with the Dorian mode in, in the verse. And then they got to the chorus and suddenly they were in this mode. Which, of course, is everyone's favorite, the Mixolydian mode. Mixolydian mode, also known as the C dominant scale, because it's like the C major scale with a flat 7. Instead of the, the normal leading tone. All right, so it had that in the chorus. So basically everything went from this... So suddenly we had this. It was a really subtle change, but it was a different mode. And the melody of the chorus went with that, you know. I was just like, wow, that's actually a really nice little melody. And it's all straight out of the Mixolydian mode. So we had Dorian mode we had for the, for the verse. And then we had Mixolydian mode. But everything was based around this bass part that was exactly the same all the way through. Um, that's all based around a C dominant, essentially, bass line. Because the, the dominant the dominant bass line fits for the Dorian as well as for the Mixolydian. Uh, and so the bass player basically could just lock into this groove with the with the with the drums and stay right there on that chord and then play occasional little fills here and there, but was basically just vamping around this one little cool little bass line with, uh, and locking straight in with the drums. And then so you're just left with the variation being the change from Dorian to Mixolydian, but staying on the same key center. Um, and it was really good. I was just like, hmm, there's somebody that actually really does know what they're talking about and does know what they're doing. Um, and it made 
for a song that didn't have particularly good lyrical content into something that kind of did pique my interest a little bit. Now, the average listener is not going to get any of that. They're just going to go, hmm, interesting. Meh. They might even like the groove, but, you know, they, they're, they're not going to get the story. They're not going to get the narrative because, really, the lyrics were terrible. Um, for me, it was a big letdown in that respect because it could have been a really, really great song, but for the terrible, terrible lyrics that just didn't really say very much and didn't really have a story to tell. And then the chorus was just kind of like, it was just a bit lost, but the melody was, was quite nice. And this change of mode was nice. Uh, and I liked the modal approach. It kind of worked. It's just a shame that whoever they got to, to do the lyrics was, you know, probably should be uh, looking for a new job. Uh, I would suggest. Marcia Ambrosius, maybe? Yeah, possibly, actually. I'm not sure. Um, it was definitely a black R&B artist. Um, and I don't know whether she writes her own songs or whether, you know, she um, performs songs that are written for her by, you know, kind of a, a, a songwriting team that, that are based at the record label. That might be the case. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but the song did not have a particularly big range to it. It was like... You know, it was like a flat seven, basically. Um, which I suppose by today's standards is actually quite a large tessitura for a song. Uh, you know, where most songs kind of like they'll go up to a fifth. And then back. Uh, she's a pianist, is she? Okay, well, uh, in this particular case, I didn't see her playing a piano. There was no piano there and she wasn't playing. Um, she was just uh, standing with, with a mic. Um, but yeah, it, it was an okay song, actually. You know, there were, there were some interesting things going on with it. It's just a shame the song was murdered by the poor lyrics. <laughs> the poor lyrics, man. Totally wrecked an otherwise good sounding piece of music. Um, but yeah, uh. So that was kind of in C. Dorian. So, you know, uh, C. Dorian, because it has the... Because it has only two flats, it's kind of... I know it's, it's, its key center is C, but really in terms of its key signature, it's probably... You'd probably give it a, a, the, key, the same key signature as, as, as B flat major. Because essentially it is a mode of B flat major. It's basically a scale, a scale ba off, based off the second degree of the B flat major scale. If you were to start the B flat major scale correctly on the B flat, you'd get right. So if you then start that scale on the C, you get the Dorian mode. So in terms of key center. It's very much C minor, and then it goes to C dominant, but but really, in terms of key signature, because you've got the A natural, it's got to be a key signature of B flat major rather than C minor, which would have the three flats, which are the same as E flat major, because E flat major is the relative major of C minor. Um, but yeah, there we go. Uh, Brett says a lot of pop slash R&B songs these days have like 15 lyric writers, hence no cohesive narrative. This is so true. Um, oh, uh, who, who had the, who had the song Girls Rule the World or something like that? Uh, I can't remember who had that song. But what I do remember about that song is um the lyrics are awful it was a massive monster hit song because there's so much good stuff in it from a performance point of view and from a arranging point of view good melody good arrangement which kind of rescues the song but the lyrics are really really a bit on the shit side to be honest 
My personal opinion, yours may vary, and feel free to debate me on that. That's fine. Um, but uh, the lyrics, are, <laughs> my opinion, the lyrics are terrible. Um, but it ended up being a massive monster hit. Um, but it's when I, when I looked at the number of uh, writers for this song, it was just like, there were like eight people that wrote this song. Beyonce, thank you, Boris. It was Beyonce. There's like eight people that wrote that bloody song. <laughs> eight people wrote that song. And there's so little content to it. Certainly in terms of the lyrics, there's so little content. But there's a lot of other things that they did. Good production, good arrangement, lots of ear candy, a decent melody, a darn good groove. Almost, almost completely perfect infectious groove that they had for that song, which is probably why it was so successful. But the lyrics are dreadful. Seriously. I mean, man. And there's, 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 there's another R&B artist whose name I will not mention because she had a moderate hit with uh, a song that has some very, very explicit, very sexually explicit lyrics. And when I, when I saw that song, I was just like, man, oh man. If ever I was going to write a song that was deliberately terrible, deliberately bad, if I was ever going to teach on Songwriting Simplified how to write a terrible song that song would be it, but the lyrical content, I mean, man, seriously, where are you going with that? I mean, do we really need to know about those kind of things that's in that song? I think you probably know the one I'm talking about, the one that's kind of orientated around, um, should we say, anatomy and physiology, uh, and, you know, of the female kind, that particular song, and uh, yeah, that's that's a very fine example in absolutely cataclysmically awful songwriting. And again, there's like ten people that wrote that song. What? <laughs> I mean, why do you need so many people to sit and write one song? I mean, what do they do? Do they just like do that thing, you know, where you you have like a, a sheet of paper and a pen and everybody goes out of the room and one person goes in and then they write a line and then they fold the paper over so you can see the line and then the next person goes in and writes a line and then folds that over so that the, the next person coming in cannot see the previous two lines. And then that person writes a line and so on until like all 10 people have written a line each. And then they unfold it and that's, that's it. That's the lyrics. And they hand that over to the artist and they say, right, sing that. Maybe that's how they write those songs these days. Could that be the next contest, writing the worst song? Oh, please, no. <laughs> <coughs> no, <laughs> no, we will not be doing a worst song contest. Um, however, I have thought about this potentially uh, as a possible contest. I'm not 100% going for this yet, but um, there is such a thing as the Eurovision Song Contest. And... I did think maybe it'd be quite fun to put out a challenge uh, whereby maybe it would be would be quite fun to write a song that's kind of completely pastiche Eurovision. Basically, think of all the best elements of that that kind of Euro European pop, that European trash pop, awful pop. European pop style and then write a song in that style um, and then we kind of decide 
would this be Eurovision worthy or not? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that could be a contest. Neil says, it sounds like this particular criticism is more a matter of your own taste in content than it actually being badly written. No, I think it is actually genuinely a case of the song was badly written. Um, because, you know, I think, I think there are, there are subject matters that should, that can be written about, but I think I'm having to be careful about how I choose my words here. I think you can write about those kind of subjects. I think you can write about physiology and you can write about anatomy. Uh, and I don't see anything wrong with writing about anatomy and physiology and, you know, coitus and that kind of thing. Don't have a problem with it. It's in a lot of, it's in a lot of pop songs. In actual fact, there's songs about sex and, you know, intercourse and that kind of stuff in songs going back to the 1920s and even be before then going back to the 19 teens, you know, when there was no recording, you know, you couldn't record anything. There was no way to re record audio back in the 19 teens. Um, so that's why songbooks were created. And that's, that's how Tin Pan Alley uh, started. Uh, and, you know, you had songbooks instead. Uh, collections of songs. You know, songs that were written by these people in, in Tin Pan Alley. Um, and among them are, you know, Irving Berlin and the Gershwin Brothers and, and people like that who, you know, they rose to incredible prominence out of that. But, um, and so there are, there are songs that are pretty, that have got reasonably explicit lyrics for the 1920s and 1930s that you'll find amongst all of those Tin Pan Alley songs. And then there's songs that are just completely unnecessarily graphic just for the sake of being graphic. And, and I don't think that's smart songwriting. Uh, and I, I don't see that as a matter of taste. I see that as, as a matter of why are you writing about what you're writing about? Are you writing about that to just have just, just for shock value? Are you wanting to get people to buy the song just sheerly because it's shocking? Or are you, or does the music stand up on its own? Does the song and the music stand on its own? Or is it the shock value of the lyrical content that you're going to try and use to sell the song? Um, so that's where to me, it's not about taste. It's about is this song actually good? Uh, and are you just using the, the, the lyrical content to, to, um, you know, to kind of be controversial and step over certain boundaries in order to, uh, to just, to just get a lot of clicks, a lot of listens, a lot of downloads on Spotify and that kind of thing. Even though in order to make $1, you still have to have about three and a half, if not 4 million downloads on Spotify. So, yeah. But, I mean, I th I'm not poo-pooing your question, Neil. Uh, I think it's a valid question. I think it's a valid point that you make. Um, you know, because taste is important. And, and talking about taste is important. Uh, and, you know, each to their own. Everybody has their own taste. You know, some people do like shock rock. Some people do like, you know, uh, you know, the whole, the whole point of some of that music um, is its performance aspect where, you know, the head off of, off a bat would be bitten off and eaten in front of the audience with, you know, blood pumping out of it and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then songs about that kind of stuff uh, being performed. Um, for me personally, that's not my thing. That's, n that's not music that entertains me at all. It's music that actually gives me a bit of a headache and uh, is not what I want to listen to. 
On the other hand, you might not, you might really not like Irving Berlin, and you might really not like George and Ira Gershwin, and you might really not not like, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein and uh, Lennon and McCartney, and of course, you know, then, uh, you know, Becker and Fagan, and uh, you know, uh, Bert Bacharach and other great songwriters, Marvin Hamlish and other great songwriters and arrangers. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, a good song should stand on its own and it should stand on its own two feet. Um, you know, that's my view, whatever the genre is, whether it's, you know, extreme speed, thrash, screamo, death metal, fused with, uh, the music of Vivaldi or whatever it might be. That doesn't really bother me um, because I think good songs can exist in any genre. You know, now for me personally, listening to Screamo is a challenge. It's not something I like listening to, but because I have adjudicated a lot of song contests over the years, <laughs> some of them at high schools and some of them at universities and colleges and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I've, I've heard some screamo songs and you know, yes, it's not my thing at all. It, uh, the style of music I find distasteful and an annoyance and all of that. But here's the thing. I recognize a good song when I hear it. And if there's a good lyric, if there's, um, in Screamo, you're not really going to get much of a melody. But if there's good lyrics and there's good emotion and there's, uh, you know, there's good heart to the song and, you know, maybe there is a narrative that I can sink my teeth into and I can understand what it's talking about and I can understand what the chorus is about and I can understand where it's going, um, even if it is just personally for me a lot of noise yes i will say that's a good song and that song is as good as you know jim steinman's um songs on uh the bat out of hell record for meatloaf and other great songs you know american pie is another great song um it's a really really well crafted songs and the, so in pretty much every genre the, the, there is, I, if I hear a good song, I'll go, yeah, that's a great song. You know? Whether I personally like the style or not. Like, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example here. Kylie Minogue's Can't Get You Out of My Head. I'm not a fan of hers. Um, I personally don't think she's got a particularly good voice because... She sings with a very tight, closed throat, and she sings out of her nose quite a lot. So, you know, her, she has considerable technical flaws to the way she produces her voice when she sings. Um, but that song is a really well-crafted song. Okay, the lyrics are a little bit on the cheesy side. It's okay. Um, and it's not really my style of music personally, but the arrangement of the song, the melody, it's catchy. You know, and actually it does have some nice chord changes in it as well. So, you know, there's, there's good, there's good use of chord changes. It has a nice groove to it. Um, and you know, there's, there's decent lyrics to it. But it's that little hook line. Uh, and it's that that keeps people interested in that song. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's justifiably a hit song. For, that re for all of those reasons, it's got all the key ingredients you need to make a hit song. And she did. Uh, and actually, to her credit, over the years, I think she has recognized that she does have significant limitations technically to what she can do as a vocalist and what she has done is she has learned 
how to get the best out of her voice and how to make the best use of what she does have within those limitations. She's learned how to be very creative within those limitations. You know, um, you know, Miles Davis, probably one of the most recognizable um, and most successful trumpet players on the planet, um, pioneered several different um, styles of jazz music over a 50-year career period, right? Not necessarily technically the greatest trumpet player. He had significant technical flaws. Um, he didn't have a particularly good high register. He could go up into the high register, but it, it, was, it was a bit hit or miss as to whether he would hit the notes. And he would split notes more often than, than a, a, a good, you know, top flight professional trumpet player should. But here's the thing that Miles Davis recognized. He recognized that he had a weakness, a technical flaw in his playing. And he decided that actually he was going to make that technical flaw a feature of his playing. And that's when he discovered the the harmon mute that you can put into the end of your trumpet and it turns uh, the the really bright brash sound of a trumpet into something soft and maybe a little bit fragile and a little bit brittle and then he went and had a hit song with cindy lauper's time after time beautiful beautiful performance of that song and then he also did michael jackson's human nature uh and turned that pop song into something equally uh, evocative and beautiful. So, you know, weakness doesn't necessarily mean that's the end for you as a, as a musician, as an artist, learn how to be creative with what you have, recognize where your limitations are and learn how to be creative within those limitations. Uh, whether that's as a, as a performing artist on an instrument with your voice on a guitar and a trumpet saxophone whatever it is you play um, but also as a songwriter recognize where your limitations are um, and that might be your lim one of your limitations is you work within this particular style of music you are happy with working in these particular key signatures or key centers whatever's appropriate for your style of music um, and your songs uh, have these particular parameters be incredibly creative and smart within those uh, limitations and you'll find that you'll write really really great songs and there's a lot of potential for writing really really fantastic songs I think everybody can do that I think everybody watching tonight can do that everybody watching tonight can write a fantastic song that that has the potential to be a hit song you can it's not about finding the right formula it's not about finding the right ingredients to make a hit song it's about being creative with what you've got and i don't know if you can hear that but that was my wife flushing the toilet <laughs> at the appropriate moment uh, Neil says, I think the most hilarious shock song ever is The Last Caress, simply uh, because the music sounds happy, simple, in a major key, while the lyrics are horrific. Yes, and that's what I'm talking about when I was talking about uh, juxtaposition. I love doing that. So my, my song about death was a really happy, upbeat, kind of four-to-the-floor Chicago shuffle song. It's just like, you know. And yet it's talking about this guy being very slowly squished to death by this heavy roller um, and stuff like that. Um, a Rose Boring Alice says the whole idea of a singer, however, the tonality is the fact that their voice will be recognizable. I always felt bad when listening to Miles, kind of like a fresh fish being descaled. <laughs> That's a very descriptive way to des to describe Miles Davis's trumpet playing, for sure. But yes, there are some great vocalists who don't have particularly strong, uh, technically correct voices. 
Um, I think I've mentioned one there. I would also mention another one. So Kylie Minogue, Sinead O'Connor, the late Sinead, uh, is definitely one that I would also rec uh, recognize as, as being one of those who is very creative within her limits. Um, you know, she had a massive monster hit with that song, Nothing Compares to You. Um, and one of the things that's, that's most disturbing about that song, and it's deliberate, it is so utterly deliberate, which makes it fantastic, is the fact that she juxtaposes major thirds over minor chords, minor thirds over major chords in the melody. And it's done deliberately. You think she's singing out of tune. She's not. She's done that deliberately. Um, but she does, again, sing through her nose. And when you, when you, when you, uh, if you have ever seen her perform live, she does have this tendency when she sings through her nose to sing a little bit on the sharp side. She was always aware of this little flaw that she had. But when it came to recording in the studio, and this is in the days, in the days before Melodyne and certainly in the days before Autotune and things like that, um, <clears throat> she learned to develop a technique whereby she could use her, her slightly wonky intonation to really, really good effect. And Nothing Compares to You was one of those, um, one of those songs where it was particularly evocative. So that's two. Um, <clears throat> the third uh, would be Donald Fagan. Donald Fagan does not have a great singing voice. Um, because he, he doesn't, again, he's one of these guys that doesn't really produce the voice correctly. It's, it's a lot of this kind of upper respiratory tract area and into the vocal folds here. This is where a lot of his projection comes from. Um, and it gives him a unique tone, a unique sound for his voice, which makes Donald Fagan very recognizable. Whenever you hear him sing, you go, oh, that's Donald Fagan, that's Steely Dan. And you and I'm wearing the Steely Dan T-shirt, but you recognize his voice pretty much instantly. Michael McDonald is the exception here. Michael McDonald has a fantastic singing voice. He has great technique, but again, his voice is very, very distinctive and recognizable, because again, he has learned how to be incredibly powerfully creative with uh, a particular. Um, a, a, a particular inhibition that he has in the way that he produces his voice, although he had uh, a lot of intensive training um, with the way he sings. Uh, I'm going to think of a couple more. Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury uh, was a fantastic vocalist. What a huge range he had. What a huge big voice he had. How did he have that? He had a lot of opera training. Uh, he went and studied opera um, to be an operatic tenor. That's where he got that voice from. His flaw is that vibrato of his. It was kind of a little bit like a, a machine gun vibrato, really fast, um, you know, kind of vibrato that kind of wavers like that, um, uh, which was basically a lack of control or a lack of ability to be able to control um, his vocal folds. Uh, and that's where that very, very light, fast vibrato comes from. Uh, Randy Crawford had a similar one, but in both those cases with those vocalists, uh, they used it to great effect, especially Randy Crawford in... Um, uh, damn it, what's that song that she had a massive hit? It was a come for her, it was a comeback hit. Uh, her career was, was down, heading down the toilet and then she, Street Life, Street Life. And she sang that with, uh, the Crusaders and, uh, it was a massive monster hit. Not only is it a great song, but she performed the ass off that song, uh, in, when they did the vocal tracking session. Uh, it's, fa it's a great performance, but again, she had that really fast vibrato. Uh, Fagan is definitely no Sinatra, yes. Uh, Neil says, are we going to mention Bob Dylan? Yes, we should, seeing as we're talking about 
um, a great songwriter, not necessarily a great singer, not necessarily got a great voice, but made the most of what he had in a really, really creative way. Um, for sure. Uh, there are faster vibrato singers like Gord Downey. Oh my gosh, yeah, that's that really is a machine gun vibrato. And again, that kind of really, really fast vibrato comes out of... Um, it, it, it's all to do with not really supporting the voice and the air column with your diaphragm and pushing the note up through... You know, you, you, when, you're, when you're singing, you have to imagine pushing the note up through your body and out through your vocal folds and out through your mouth as if it's coming from your feet. So it's like you're pulling the note up and through. Um, that's kind of the correct way to do it. Um, but most people don't do that <laughs> uh, unless you're Michael McDonald. Michael McDonald has a beautiful, beautiful voice. Nice wide open throat, nice wide open air column. That's why the guy has such a big range. He can sing right up here, but he can also sing right down in his boots. Um, so yeah. Anyway, you kind of got got me going into vocal coach mode there. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I have been a vocal coach in the past. Uh, I don't do it so much anymore. Uh, Sean says, I've learned that by getting started, you develop your sound over time. There is a gospel artist I didn't like before that I do now after her development. Yes. Yep. Uh, Aurora's Boring Alice said, it's the magic wand as you go along. Read the ability to write a good song and stay in your lane. Yeah, she would, she would flat on purpose. Keep in mind she was Irish. Yeah, uh, Sinead, um... Sometimes it was quite deliberate, like I said, singing a minor third on a major chord and vice versa, a, a major third on a minor th on a minor chord. She did that quite deliberately, and she had a pretty good talent at pitching that against those chords. Um, so she had a really good a really good talent for being able to do that. Um, however, sometimes it was just a happy accident that she happened to pitch that in betweeny note. Like she would sing maybe, she'd try and pitch like a flattened fifth, bending that fifth downwards just a wee bit. And unfortunately it would just come off instead of being emotive and emotional and bluesy. Sometimes it would come off as just being a little bit flat. <laughs> um, but you know, you knew what her intent was. And again, she had a small little range of maybe an octave and a third, an octave and a fourth, maybe. So kind of a range of about of um, an eleventh. Um, and she, But she knew how to work that range of her voice really, really well. Anyway, we are done and my voice is pretty much giving up the ghost. So we're going to call it there. Thank you for the uh, 15 of you who have hit the like button. And thank you for the... 18, 19, or 20, uh, 19 of you that have been here tonight and you've hung out with me. Thanks a lot for your company. Thanks a lot for your patience. And thanks a lot for your questions. I appreciate it. It's been a good little discussion there. Um, I appreciate it. Alanis Morissette. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Uh, she had a really unusual, distinctive voice that you either liked or didn't like. The thing about her voice, it was perfect for the songs that she wrote. Perfect for the songs that she wrote. Like the, the songs on the Jagged Little Pill record. My gosh. Every song on that record is really, really good. And her voice is just perfect for it. Anyway, we're done. Thanks a lot, folks. And I will see you on Sunday for Sunday Night Live. We'll be back to Studio On Questions. I am sure... You will all have plenty of Studio One questions, so please do bring them, and I will do my best to answer them as best I can, uh, especially now that Studio One 6.6 .6 is out, and we have Studio One Plus Hybrid, and we've got a few other things that came as well. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you guys have got some, some interesting questions, and we can discuss those on Sunday. So I will see you then, folks, and I will bid you a very good day. Night. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate you all. Bye for now.